so as I was just introduced, Thais Mendonca, uh, head of regulatory uh, for Latin America at Stripe. Uh, I'm honored to be here. It's it feels very good to be back to in-person events. Uh, here by my side, my dear colleague, Marila De Cara. Marila. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Marila De Cara, Senior Managing Counsel for FinTech at Booking.com. I will echo Thais' words, so nice to be back to live events. And we hope you will enjoy our session. Thank you, Marila. So open banking, uh, that's what we're here to talk about. So let's get started. What is open banking? Well, there's a definition that I find uh, very to the point uh, given by the Bozell Committee on Banking Supervision. And as you can see in the screen, the sharing and leveraging of customer permission data by banks with third-party developers and firms to build applications and services, including, for example, those that provide real-time payments, greater financial transparency options for account holders, marketing and cross-selling opportunities. Uh, I, I think it summarizes the key elements of open banking. That's why it's so appropriate. Of course, each country will be able to set forth their own regulatory framework and their own legal definition. But I think here we can find the key elements uh, to open banking. Uh, again, it's banks being able to share information from their customers to third parties to provide innovative solutions to these customers. However, provided that these customers authorized access to their information. And this is very important when you think of open banking. It's very customer centric. The customer owns the information. So any sharing will only happen to the extent that the customer has authorized for the time frame that the, the customer has authorized and for the purpose that the customer has authorized. So you see that everything revolves around the customer. And that's why it's so interesting, right? Uh, although banks have been sharing customer information for many years, I think what's new here is that we're migrating to this digital world where you have uh, such interesting new technologies that will lead us to what we are calling open banking, right? So uh, I wrote down here at the screen, you can see a couple of examples. So comparison of fees practiced by industry players, financial advisory, wealth planning, and when you think of those two first bullets, uh, think of those platforms that are aggregating co customer information uh, and helping the customer to see a summary of their entire financial life. Uh, and with that, the, the customer is able to make better, more educated decisions about their future because they're seeing the aggregate of their, of their financial lives in one place, in one platform. Uh, another example, payment initiation through social media. So we, if you think of the Brazilian Central Bank's PIX, the instant payment system established by the Central Bank, together with payment initiation, you have non-banks pushing the transfer of funds from one account to the other real time and this is less costly for the, the, the customer, and it also offers a better user experience. It's really interesting. Uh, and finally, you can see access to credit marketplace. Uh, I, I'd say that during the pandemic, there was also an increase on, on the use of digital services. So we were all uh, working from home, shopping from home, entertaining ourselves from home. Right, And uh, with this, uh, the industry had access to more rich data flows about ourselves, about the customers, right? And they were able to customize offerings based on that rich data flows that they obtained. So to that point, understanding the customer's uh, patterns and behaviors is, is power, right? Um, we are now living a, a new era 
we are seeing innovation, we are seeing so much going on that in my view, open banking will never be static. It will be always very dynamic. And, and this represents a huge challenge for, for policymakers, for regulators, and for the market alike. Uh, things will be constantly changing and adapting, and it's, it's sort of, uh, we will be sort of, of chasing our tails, trying to constantly catch up with, with what's happening, right? Um, I think new business models will be emerging all the time. So let's see, let's see. I, I do think that regulators are mindful of that and are creating the regulatory framework with that in their minds. Uh, open banking will migrate to open finance and in some countries they already have. In Brazil, recently the Brazilian Central Bank changed the denomination of open banking to open finance. This is happening elsewhere as well. Uh, and we will head to what I think we will call open data. Uh, there's, there's this saying that I think is, is, is very sharp and to the point. Uh, open banking is not about banking, it's about data, right? Uh, and and I if you think that the industry is having more and more access to customer data, uh, not only banking, but health, telecommunications, social media, usage of energy. If you think of how we can connect all those data flows, all those sets of data, and how we can customize products for our customers with all this information that we obtain from them, it's, it's very rich. Uh, something that I, I also think we need to be mindful of when we think of open banking, we usually think of banks transmitting information to third parties. But we know that big tech also hold really relevant information about customers. So there needs to be reciprocity, right? There needs to be banks sending information to non-banks and vice versa. And uh, many of the regulatory framework that is currently being set, in, set forth already takes that in mind. Okay, it's not only banks transmitting information, it's broader than that. Uh, so it's gonna be really interesting to see, in fact, what I, what I call uh, open data. Uh, having said that, Marilia, what are your views uh, about open banking and what's going on in, in Latin America? Thank you, Thais. Uh, I'll excuse myself and I'll just stand. Um, so I think certainly the principles and the open data trends that you were alluding to, they cut across the region and they apply to most jurisdictions. And also the broad definition of open banking, it's also true uh, in most countries in Latin America. But still, it's very interesting to see how regulators are shaping their frameworks and how the pace of implementation uh, of open banking varies across the, the LATAM countries. So I'll start with Brazil, and because it's the front runner in terms of implementation of open banking. And one will say I'm biased because I was born and raised in Brazil, but the truth is they are more advanced in the implementation. Um, and I want to spend two minutes talking about uh, its framework be because it also served as inspiration uh, for the other countries in the region as they build their own models. So Brazil adopted a phased approach towards open banking. And I think this had a very positive effect to the participating entities because they could actually take the time to gradually implement the requirements and also to the regulator itself because this allowed the regulation to evolve and mature together with the implementation. So both parties could make tweaks here and there to actually accommodate their needs. So phase one encompasses basically sharing of standardized information, traditional banking products. So at this point, there's no sharing of personal data or transactional data. The purpose is mainly to allow customers to have a better view, a more transparent view of what the product entails. So it's not uncommon to see uh, the features of banking products scattered around the, the websites with the fine print, very hard to understand. So the point here was, for instance, allow a customer to understand what, are the, what is the average interest rate charged on uh, consumer loans. Then moving on to phase two, that's when the actual sharing of personal data and of transactional data started. 
Um, so basically, to Thay's point on consent, upon authorization of the customer, the participating entities were allowed to intake financial information, analyze behavioral and analytical data, and then revert back to the customer with tailor-made advice or suggestions or indications of what type of products would better fit their profiles. Then moving on to phase three, um, that's when non-banking entities were allowed to step in, for instance, providing initiation of payment services via the central bank instant payment rails. And then finally, phase four, we just kicked off late last year, and which was this actual movement from open banking towards open finance and potentially in the near future towards open data. So we're actually seeing sharing of information outside of the purely banking realm. So we're talking information about insurance, foreign exchange, payroll loans, uh, pension funds, and so on and so forth. So why is Brazil moving so fast? I think there, there are two main reasons for that. One, uh, the open banking initiatives aligns with the Brazil Central Bank agenda that started back in 2017 to promote initiatives that would foster competition, innovation, financial education, financial stability. So this has been in the radar of the regulator for quite some time. And also, portability of data was not exactly a new subject. This has been a hot topic in Brazil even before open banking um, discussion started. And on that note, I wanted to give you um, some insight on an iconic case in Brazil of this Guia Bolso. I don't know if you heard about Guia Bolso. They're, they were a huge aggregator of financial data that operated a platform that would fetch uh, banking login credentials. And obviously when I say fetch, upon consent of the consumers, they would volunteer their banking credentials for this aggregator to have a view on their banking history and on their financial behaviors and then revert back with financial insight, recommendations, and et cetera. As you can imagine, traditional banks' initial reaction to that business model was not very good, and they even challenged the model, claiming this is in violation of bank secrecy laws. This information is protected by bank secrecy laws in Brazil. So this resulted in court proceedings to determine whether there was actually a breach of bank secrecy and also in antitrust investigation by the antitrust authorities to determine if restricting Guia Bolso activities could ultimately be seen as a, an anti-competitive practice. So making a long story short, Guia Bolso prevailed and this ultimately uh, was seen by the banks as an eye-opener to the extent that this was not really an isolated case. It was evidence that this trend of sharing of banking information had actually come to stay. And this is no different in other countries. If we move on to Mexico, open banking concept was introduced by the Mexican FinTech law in 2018 and then followed by general rules that would, were published by the CNBV, uh, the, CN, uh, the Mexican regulator in 2020. And it basically deals with standardized API connectivity, very similar to phase one of Brazil. It's just dealing with uh, broader information on traditional banking products with no sharing of personal data at this point. Um, so the evolution here is still pending, issuance of secondary regulation. But one other thing I wanted to mention about Mexico is that its open banking model is also gravitating towards the UK mandatory model of open banking, which is also the same that inspired the Brazil model. What does that mean? It means, one, that certain participating entities, certain regulated entities must uh, become a part of the open banking system. And two, the framework for open banking arises mostly from rulings of law. So that's why it's called like a mandatory approach. Then we have Chile, which is also following Brazil's steps very closely um, and conceiving this model that is based on a progressive adoption of open banking requirements. And then I wanted to draw your attention to Colombia because different from its fellow countries, Colombia is leaning towards more of a voluntary approach, which opposed to the mandatory approach means that participants may elect to participate in the open banking uh, regimes or not, and two, 
uh, the rules and the framework for the open banking will probably be different in nature. They will be more of in the along the lines of guidelines or best practices. And I think it will be interesting to see if this flexibility that is given to the market will ultimately make increased adoption. It will actually encourage participants uh, to join the open banking to the extent that they will have some leeway to choose what rules are actually appropriate to their system, or if it will simply discourage them to actually join to the extent that it's not mandatory. So still to be seen. And then lastly, I wanted to mention Peru and Argentina, which are now taking more of a wait and see approach. So they have their regulations still at a very early stage. So in a nutshell, I think it's undeniable that open banking is a global trend, but what makes it so special about Latin America? Um, and I think about certain key factors that actually show why open banking is so promising in our region. And I think this chart here also helps illustrate the potential of open banking because it shows a little bit of the penetration of certain key banking products. So I think uh, why open banking is so important to our region. I think one, it will promote competition. I think it's undeniable that a more democratic access uh, to financial information will allow newcomers to actually provide banking or banking-like services, opening up new possibilities to people who today do not have access to those type of products. Two, it will enable financial inclusion, which we know is also key in our region. On the customer side, we have high rates of unbanked population who do not have a direct connection to the banks, and open banking will potentially allow them to have access to those products. And on the banking side, this can also be beneficial because this will improve the penetration of banking products in remote areas. So we still have, in a way, a, high, a structure that is highly dependent on branches and bank correspondence. So open banking has the potential to actually improve the distribution channels of banks. Three, unlocking access to credit. We all know that credit underwriting, credit um, scoring can be bureaucratic, time consuming, and very rigorous upon certain uh, customers. So the access to more qualitative data and to simplified process will probably um, unlock access to credit to a broader number of people. And finally, I think I would mention fostering innovation and financial education. Clearer visibility of their financial life and a better understanding of their financial decisions will probably help people make better and more informed decisions with respect to their investments, um, with their spend and credit, and et cetera. So this is a beautiful wish list. Um, so what, what would be, in my mind, what will actually drive the success of open banking? And I would say creating awareness. For you to have an idea, a research done in Europe at the end of 2021 showed that only 22% of EU consumers had heard of open banking, and only one-fifth out of those 22% actually knew what it meant. Also, over 80% of consumers reported that they would not trust non-banking entities to handle their money. So I think this shows that education of consumers is really key. They need to know and understand why their information is passing from hand to hand, and they need to know what is the value in allowing so many entities to actually have a real good glimpse of what their behaviors are and what their habits, consuming habits are. And I think this ties nicely with what Thais was saying in the beginning about this migration from the sector-specific notion of open banking towards this open data notion. Because the more comprehensive the profile of a customer is going to be, the easier it will be for this customer to feel that the system is reliable and actually helping him making better decisions. And I think certainly this movement from open banking to open data is what's been shaking up the status quo, right? Don't you absolutely, agree? Absolutely, absolutely, Marilia. Uh, I think open data uh, is an important aspiration. And uh, I think there, there are a couple incremental steps to get there, but I do think we're headed in the right direction to get there. <laughs> Who knows, maybe next year we'll be back 
with talking more, more about open data. Certainly. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>